Hello friends, today we're going to do some screen adjustments on a Macintosh Color Classic. Now this display looks pretty good, so you may be wondering, well, what are we going to adjust? But if you look very closely along the very top, you'll see that there's this black gap here, and it's not the same width at the bottom, which means that it is not vertically centered. Also, if you look over here on the right side, you'll see a little bit more of the black gap on this side than you do on the other side. And that's because it is not horizontally centered. Furthermore, there's a little bit of a problem if we look very close in this upper right corner. Just right around this area, we'll see a faint red line. It's like a little bit of red fringing here. So what we're going to do is open up this color classic and check out the controls that are used to fix these and other video related problems. We can adjust the brightness and contrast through the dedicated control panel or change brightness only through the front panel controls. And we can change the horizontal and vertical centering using a tool inserted through the back slots here without opening the case but we must open the case to do all other screen adjustments. The first tool that you're going to need is a Torx T15. This particular one has a shaft that is just under 20 centimeters long, just under eight inches long. You can use a shorter one like this to open the case, although if you have a longer one, that's even better, and I'll show you why in a few moments. I put a link to this and the longer version in the text description below. Now, as you can see, this tool has a T-shaped handle, so you're not going to be able to hold it flush and turn it, but if you move it out a little bit, it is possible to do it even at an angle. Uh, but to, if they're really in there tight, to avoid stripping them, it's probably best to have a longer shaft version. And again, I've linked that for you in the text description below so that your handle will come up above the top part of the case. And with the four screws out, it's now just a simple matter of pulling up on the back case. And here we are looking at the Color Classic from the back. I just want to start off by explaining that because we are going to do all of the adjustments with the power on that's required for the adjustments that we need to do, um, I have left the motherboard installed. I have not removed it, and of course you can see there is no power cable connected here, but I have not discharged the CRT, so I'm not touching any of these metal pieces, mind you. I'm just pointing out to them uh, there is still a charge in here, and you have to be careful. Uh, below the motherboard, we can see there's a metal shield here, and there's three offsets here, here, and here. The offsets are mounted to the motherboard to keep this metal shield pushed away, about a half centimeter away at least, from the motherboard because this is not insulated on the opposite side. And so if this shield is pushed up against the motherboard with the power on, you will short out the motherboard and destroy it. So you have to make sure that when we do finally sit down the Color Classic on a desk, it needs to be a flat desk with no objects that are going to push up onto this shield. If you push it with a finger or have a block or something underneath it, and then you lay the, the machine down on top of that, theoretically it could push up, bend, and short out on the motherboard. So just make sure if you're repeating the steps that you see in this video, you want to use a flat disc. And then only this edge will actually make contact uh, with the disc. Now we're not gonna touch any of these things, but just to let you know, this is the speaker here. And then deeper down beyond the speaker is the floppy disk drive. And then in this slot over here is the hard disk drive. We've got the power switch, the power cable connector. And then here is where all of our video adjustments, well, not all, but most of the video adjustments will be. And uh, we'll discuss those a little bit later. This is the yoke board or the equivalent of the yoke board, like on an SE and SE30. And as you can see, there's a whole number of uh, controls that you have here on the Color Classic, which you don't have on an SE and SE30. And uh, so you get really fine control when you're making adjustments like this. This is the convergence adjustment, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. And here is the label on the back of the CRT. We can see that it's a Sony Trinitron, which gives you a much higher quality picture than the uh, old color shadow mask tubes. 
And up here we have the vertical and horizontal convergence controls which expand or shrink the screen size to get better convergence. And then down here we have focus. There are a variety of other controls too, including these six sliders around the yoke, and even magnets that are temporarily glued to the CRT. Uh, but we're not going to be touching those particular controls today. Now because we're going to be working in this with the power on, I purchased a set of plastic CRT tools from Amazon Japan. That's why Japan, Japanese is written on it. But I'll link uh, some tools for you on Amazon USA in the text description below. But basically I have these tools and then I have some of these plastic tools that I acquired from somewhere many years ago. So we're going to test these tools to see which size is most appropriate for the adjustments we're going to do today. Now with plastic tools we really don't need to worry about rubber gloves but my friend Kei Koba in Tokyo uh, said there will be times that you might want to work near the high voltage and so he has a pair of these gloves here that are rubber gloves and I purchased these from Amazon Japan. Uh, having some gloves to do your high voltage work is good. These technically are not, you know, it says 600 volts here and on the back it talks about 1500 volts. So these, this is not, you know, rated for 20,000 volts or anything like that, but uh, it will offer some level of protection. And if you're worried, you can get the thicker 20,000 volt type, but the thicker type are just harder to work with. But like I said, today uh, we really won't need these gloves at all because we're going to be using plastic tools. Okay, Koba suggested I start with the yoke board convergence first. And I found that this white tool, which has a 0.3 millimeter thin negative tip, a minus driver tip, fits perfectly. Uh, or I could just use my 100% plastic tool here. But this tool is all plastic except for the tip, so it's going to be fine when used. So you could use either tool. I found that using the 1.95 millimeter hex end of my yellow tool was a perfect fit for all of the video controls on back. Now before I power everything on, I just want to give you my standard disclaimer. Do not proceed in following my instructional video here today if you have any doubts about being able to do it safely. This is very high voltage electronics we're talking about here. Uh, I, I cannot be held liable if you injure or even kill yourself in the process of accidentally touching something. Use rubber gloves if you need to, but take appropriate care because this really is a very dangerous section of the computer that Apple did not want any average consumers to be fiddling with. You can do it safely if you take appropriate precautions, but I'm just saying that's my standard disclaimer. Now, we have the machine plugged in. The power switch is turned on. Uh, unlike the SE series, this does not actually power up the machine. We have to do that through the power button on the keyboard. But before we do that, you can see that the machine is sitting on a flat table. And some of the documentation suggests that you put something on the left and right edges to prop it up. But I'm not going to do that because if I bump the machine and that little object propping up slips under the, the, uh, under, the, under the shield, then it would actually cause the problem that I was warning you about. Uh, so the table's flat. It's not going to push up against and short against the circuit board, so everything is fine. All right, so now all we need to do is just press the power key. Now after you power it on, please leave it on and do not make any adjustments for at least 10 minutes. I would actually recommend about 30 minutes so that the machine has sufficiently warmed up and is not going to do any minute shifting on you while you're doing the measurements. So between 10 and 30 minutes. You could leave it on even longer if you want, but uh, absolutely no less than 10. That's what the service manual said. And for an older machine like this, leaving it on for much longer, like about 30 minutes, is probably a good idea. Well, now that it's booted, we have the screen control panel open, and I have the brightness set, I don't know what percentage it is, 75%? You can see, and the contrast is up too. I think this is, this looks nice to my eyes, so I'm just going to uh, leave it at that. And then we have here some uh, display service utility software and I put a link for you in the text description below where you can 
download this. This is an app that is quite useful when making screen adjustments. Now we can see in the top right corner we've we've got the uh, the red little line that I had mentioned earlier but also you've got a little bit of blue down here I can see the red down here of course I need to it, it probably looks kind of centered on the camera but it's not perfectly vertically and horizontally centered on screen but these are various uh, controls for example I can click this one it'll show me bars I can click this one it'll give me a pure black screen pure white screen to help me see the fringing a little bit more uh, it does say that using these lines is recommended uh, to the fringing, but actually I don't really, it's, it's a little bit harder to see. So you can use whatever really uh, you want uh, to help you make the adjustments. And of course over here, this one is for adjusting the focus. So for now, I'm just going to look up here and then make that yoke board adjustment. That's making it worse. Turning it the opposite direction uh, will adjust that, but it makes the blue brighter. So clearly that convergence adjustment alone is not going to do the trick. And I should try the top two adjustments to see what they're going to do. So this one is making the screen taller, but it seems to be eliminating the line, which is what I want. So actually this is as low as it goes. And then this is as high as it goes. So here looks pretty good actually. And then doing the horizontal. Well, on the horizontal, I'm not seeing really any adjustment at all there, and this blue is existing, which is a little bit annoying, but I got rid of the top and the bottom uh, fringing. It's just now on the left and the right. So I'm going to go back to the yoke board adjustment and do a little bit of turning on that. One direction makes it worse, and the other direction takes it away. That's actually not too bad. Now if the yoke board and neck convergence controls are not enough, you can also adjust these little tabbed rotatable controls. There's six of them here and they were originally painted and on your case they may still be perfectly painted together with uh, some kind of color, probably white, and you would have to break that to rotate them. I'm not going to do that in this video because I don't need to, but basically the first four of them would be the ones that would have an impact on convergence. And when you rotate one of the first two, then the other one will automatically rotate. So you'll probably have to use two fingers and do it like this. And you can see I have my gloves on because you will, you will need to do this with the machine powered on. And you know, you don't want to touch any of the wires around here. Even with gloves on, you just want to be very, very careful. And you can do that without loosening this screw. But if you loosen the screw, these will be easier to move. However, if you loosen it too much, then this entire section will rotate and that will <laughs> probably not be what you want to do. Uh, so you can make a decision on whether you want to loosen it or not. But be careful when you screw it down, you don't want to tighten it too much because this part is glass. Now before we do anything else, uh, let's adjust the height and width. And it suggests using an all white screen for that. And according to the Apple service source documentation, it is 124.5 by 168.5 millimeters. 
if you're in the U.S. and use inches, start using millimeters. <laughs> Even when I lived in the U.S., I really preferred it because it's much more precise, especially for something like this. Um, but basically what I did is I printed out and cut a sheet to these exact dimensions to make it easier because the screen is not perfectly flat. It's curved. So if you're using a ruler, even if your ruler does fit, it's going to be hard to get a precise measurement. So the best way I thought to do it would be to, to put this up here. And as you can see, you can see white all around it. So I'm going to adjust the vertical height. And I've got my yellow tool in the VH guy there. And uh, so that's too high. Go the opposite way. Maybe just a tad bit more. Okay. And then the width, we need to adjust HW. And that looks pretty good, actually. Now we'll do our vertical centering, which is VS. And our horizontal centering, which is HS. Now it may not be as discernible on the video, but there's slight bowing on the left and the right, which means it's, it's curved a bit. And thankfully, we can adjust that using the PB setting. After I finished with convergence, one thing I noticed is that this background should be gray. And it looks purple to my eyes. And if we go to the service utility and display the bars, we can see it's, it's rather purple instead of gray. Now, the service source color adjustments suggest you go through the cutoff, white balance, and go through a complete procedure before you start fiddling with the color. And of course, that is recommended. But just to jump and cut to the chase, I did find that adjusting the green background GB it tends to produce the best result, actually. It can produce a very nice set of gray bars like we see here. Now the one control I didn't find extremely useful, uh, this is supposed to help you with focus. While I was adjusting the focus, I mean, I, I couldn't really see it. Now I don't have the best of eyesight now at age 50, but still, I could see just very, very subtle and minute changes. And as with the SE and SE30, if you sharpen one corner, for example, then the center may not be perfectly sharp. So it's kind of a balance. But for the most part, it looks decent enough at normal viewing distances. And the minor adjustments I made, I really couldn't tell a significant difference. So you'll probably find the same when you adjust the focus as well. I must say that the Color Classic is a cute little Mac. I used to not think so, though. Uh, this front top part kind of sticks up and protrudes out, unlike the earlier compact Macs like the Macintosh 128, 512K+, Plus, SE, SE30, and the original black and white classic, which all have a flat top. But after using it for a while, it's really grown on me quite a bit, and I'm not really bothered by it at all. In fact, some would contend that the Color Classic is the ultimate compact Mac because, in part, of the bold industrial design changes that Apple made to it. And of course, the other reason is because it has that fabulous Sony Trinitron color display. Now, I've shown you in another video how I can make my SE30 to display millions of colors on an external monitor, which is pretty neat. But the fact that you can have all of that color goodness on the internal CRT in the Color Classic is just something special. The area that disappoints, though, is performance. And even though the Color Classic has the same 16 MHz 68030 processor as the SE30, it just feels so much slower overall. If I just launch a graphics app, I mean, it's just slow as molasses to launch the app. The draws on the screen are slow. Uh, it takes a long, long time to get these apps to load. And this is not a RAM limitation, even though that is a secondary problem. This is capped to only 10 megabytes max. 
so that Apple uh, wouldn't be worried that this machine was going to interfere with the sales of their higher-end machines. But just <laughs> trying to get the Git info box to open takes forever. And then you want to dig down and get your files. And it takes a while to get the listing. It just really is a frustrating experience. It's usable, I guess you could say, but it's not fun usable, uh, just, just based on how, how slow it is. We can open up this picture which I created for the opening segment, and we can see how long it takes. This is 16-bit color, but still, finally it, it displays so it's really I mean even for that menu to draw you saw that how slow it is it needs some improvement but the good news is is that we can improve it in that area through a variety of means and um, in addition to that there is also one other problem if we take a look here at the uh, monitor setting will adjust it to 256 colors because that's what most games use so you think okay I've got it down to six, 256 colors what if I try to just run a basic game like Pac-Man what's gonna happen and we can see it complains because it says well you need 640 by 480 the default resolution of the color classic is less than that so you cannot run a lot of games as a result, which kind of defeats the purpose of having color. Uh, but again, there is a solution to that as well. And on that same topic of performance, in my next video in the Color Classic series, I'm going to be talking about this monster. <laughs> More specifically, <laughs> this Monster Mac. Uh, because compared to this cute little guy, this guy is just enormous. Uh, he's a monster in size. He's got all of this stuff just stacked, 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 mile high, and it's all in one monolithic case. You can't move the monitor around. You know, I don't want to offend any of you who really love this beauty box here, but suffice it to say, he has something special to contribute to this little guy over here. Uh, specifically, he's got a 68040 processor running at 33 megahertz. Even without an FPU, it's still several times faster than this guy. Uh, it's got 36 megabytes of RAM, which was the maximum RAM back in the day, although today you can upgrade it to a whopping 128 megabytes. You can upgrade its VRAM to uh, one megabyte. And overall, I'm not gonna say anything more today, but basically in my next video, we're going to look in more detail about how an LC575 makes a color classic so much better. Now, before I close out this video, I'd like to say a big shout out of thanks to my good friend, Kei Koba in Tokyo. I mentioned his name for the first time in my last video where I covered the Big Mess of Wires Rominator. He is the authorized and official seller of that Rominator kit now. And uh, he's going to have that available very, very soon. So you wanna watch his website for that. That's for your Macintosh 128K, 512K, all the way up to the plus. He is also now the authorized seller of Blue Scuzzy, authorized by Eric Helgeson uh, here in Japan. So uh, he really has a lot to offer. There are other Blue Scuzzy sellers out there, of course, and if you're outside Japan, maybe those will work for you better, but I just want to mention that and uh, give him a little bit of a plug there because he's just an amazing person and somebody solid and reliable that you can trust if you do decide to buy from him. But more than that, he's got some amazing knowledge about the Mac, uh, just incredible especially about mods. So be sure to check out his blog and his website to see more information on that. And um, truly, without Kay, I don't think this video would have been possible. He really contributed a lot <laughs> to make it happen. So, hontoni arigato ne, Kay. Next, I'd like to thank a very special person, Mar Maro Asia Kaferi. I've mentioned him in the last several videos, and that's because he's the only person who contributes to this channel on a monthly basis through PayPal. And 
because he contributes monthly, I feel it only right to thank him on a monthly basis. So thank you very much, Mauro. Your contributions certainly go towards making this channel better. And uh, some of the things that you see in front of you today were purchased with a little bit of those contributions. So thank you. And last but not least, I'd like to give you an update on the Kai Robinson Macintosh SE Reloaded project. The reason you haven't seen my video on that is because they haven't made it yet. And the reason they haven't made it yet is because the goodie box that Kai sent me still hasn't arrived yet. Now, I was a little bit worried about it, so I sent Kai an email about it, you know, or talked to him on Discord, actually, and, and asked uh, how he shipped it, and he confirmed that he did ship it by ocean. And it was kind of a relief to me when he told me that because I was really worried if it's aired, something is seriously wrong. But uh, I was also relieved because I, I, you know, I felt bad. If, how much did he actually pay? You know, he sent me a lot of stuff. If he had shipped it by air, it would have cost a lot. And he told me, yeah, his heart would have nearly stopped when they told him how much it would have cost. And that's why he shipped it by ocean. So I'm really happy about that. A lot of the stuff that I have, I've actually used ocean shipping in the past. Uh, USPS is just so infuriating. They killed it off a number of years back. But before they did that, I got a lot of things. Most of my compact Macs that I purchased through Craigslist and eBay were shipped by ocean. I mean, if you try to do that now, one Mac, it might cost 300 US dollars just for the shipping alone. That's nuts. It probably would cost you more than the Mac. And uh, I, I've got things like a full Weber barbecue with a dome cap, you know. Uh, my parents, when my kids were young, they shipped me a full American sized baby carriage. Things that you, you would never ship over. Uh, internationally if if you, you had only airmail because it just it just would cost too much and so um, I have some experience with COVID shipping though I shipped Mark Josidis back his uh, Hewlett Packard 12C platinum calculator I did a review video on that calculator and I shipped it back by ocean just to you know say, save money he didn't really care when it came back and uh, just curious how long it would take and it took well over two and a half months from Japan to the United States and so I would assume that shipping from the UK, which is where Kai is located, to Japan is going to take much longer because, you know, the boat has to go around many more continents. It's a greater distance too. But all said, when that finally does arrive, I will start the video. But don't worry, I have been preparing. And uh, you can see here, I have my Mauser order. Boy, this was just a mess. I, I ordered this on September the 13th. I spent many hours, many days putting this together based on Kai's BOM, his bill of materials. And um, I saw the tracking information shipped out FedEx priority, I left Texas and went to another state and stayed there. It, it just moved on one day of tracking information and then day after day I checked it, 10 days later it was still not moving. I called Mauser, I called FedEx, you know, FedEx Japan, FedEx USA, and they said, we don't know where it is. It's lost. FedEx USA was worst of all. They wouldn't tell me anything and I had to ask them. I said, okay, you know, are you doing anything? <laughs> uh, what's going to happen? Don't you have a policy that says after a certain amount of time, something needs to happen? I said, you know, like maybe a month later, if it hasn't, hasn't arrived, you haven't found it. Don't you have a policy about that? So, oh yeah, if it's been a month and then, then you need to have the seller file a claim. I mean, why didn't you just tell me that? Why didn't, oh, anyway, I had to deal with all that. And uh, finally, FedEx Japan just says to me, we don't know where it is. It's gone. Contact the seller, which is in this case, Mauser. They need to file a claim and get it shipped out to you. So it took another several days for Mauser to get around to shipping it, but they finally contacted me, said, we're gonna ship you out another box. But unfortunately, um, the five, you know how it is with Mauser, right? <laughs> the day after you order something, same parts, immediately they're out of stock. So five of the parts on my order, I have many, many parts, but five of them um, were gone. You know, I couldn't order them because they're out of stock until like February of next year, crazy. And I just said, okay, you know, Mauser just canceled certain parts, but I'm gonna, I wanna swap out some others. But they shipped it before they read my email. But the interesting thing is that they did eventually read my email and uh, they shipped it out. <laughs> they shipped out my replacement parts and they didn't charge me extra for the shipping. And it's kind of like, good, good, I'm happy about it, but I'm not happy that you lost money. I mean, if you had just waited a few hours, then you could have shipped my replacement parts with the other order anyway. Big bag of goodies here, you know, I mean, parts, parts, parts up the gazoo. You, you don't have to buy all new parts when you do a motherboard build. You can pull a lot of the parts off the old board. But uh, I must say that the reason that Kai created the board in the first place is because usually you have battery bombed boards where they're mostly destroyed 
and a lot of the components may be unusable. So you're going to have to buy some new parts. But the good news is you can buy a lot of the new parts, most of them actually, that are, that are new. Uh, some of them were new old stock, but most of them brand new. In fact, you can even buy brand new the external SCSI connector. Couldn't find the external floppy connector, but I did find the internal floppy connector header and uh, a lot of the sockets and other things. Just uh, amazing. <laughs> So uh, yeah, if when I was talking about where do some of the contributions that have been made to this channel go to, I mean, this bag of parts uh, cost well over $200, perhaps my biggest Mauser order ever, about $237 or so. <sighs> a big order, a lot of parts. So this is going to be a beautiful build, truly, truly. And uh, you'll want to be sure to see that <laughs> when it does finally come out. And um, I will keep you updated if it's taking a lot longer. But basically, I just wanted to inform you that that video is definitely coming. If you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe. And once you subscribe, please click the bell icon to get notifications of when I come out with a new video. Please click show more to drop down the text description because I put a lot of useful information there. If you have any comments or thoughts to share, please leave them in the comment section below because I read and reply to every comment. Thank you again for your time, folks, and I wish each of you a great week.